Hold the Line with Mike Solon is brought to you by the Seattle Police Officers Guild, Seattle's public safety voice. Now, I'm a science guy. You know, I'm, I'm really interested in numbers. So I looked at the numbers on, you know, on interactions of police with, with folks and to see whether there's a, the police are killing you know, people of certain minority groups more than others, yes. you know, preferentially. Right. And I looked at the numbers, and it wasn't true. Not true at all. It isn't true at all. The line must be drawn here. This far, no farther. This is where we hold them. This is where we fight. We will not go quietly into the night. We will not vanish. Not a fight. Hold the line. Hey, welcome back to Hold the Line with Mike Solon. Special guest in studio is Cliff Mass. Cliff Mass moves the needle for me, and I think for many others, about the reasonable people in this community that have an opinion, an informed opinion, and his historic knowledge on weather-related issues in the Pacific Northwest. More importantly, he weighs in on social issues, more in terms of public safety, and happy to have Cliff Maths in studio. Stay tuned. We're going to break it down. Cliff, how you doing? Pretty good. Good to see you, Mike. Good to see you. I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, the first time we met was August 2020, that's right. Uh, in person, why we held the public safety rally at City Hall, never been done before. We got about four thousand people in attendance. I think it was that's a profound, you know, group of people in terms of the numbers and the height of COVID. And I think we were speaking out against the defunding nonsense that right. the council was entertaining via the activist groups. And you came and uh, you spoke eloquently. And I uh, just kind of want to pick your brain on that and get into other topics. But before we get into that, tell the audience who the hell you are and um, why you think it's important to connect with me, and then we'll explore from there. Sure. Well, I'm a professor of atmospheric sciences, and uh, I teach weather forecasting and climate. So that's what I do professionally. But I'm also very interested in public interactions and public policy. I have a blog that's heard by maybe 15 to 20,000 or read by 15 to 20,000 people a day. That's good. So that's pretty good. And I a have day? A, a day. And I have a podcast. And so uh, I'm very interested in the interaction of a, basically a public intellectual, you know, a scientist with the community. Uh, most of the time I just talk about weather, but occasionally I talk about public policy issues, which I think are very important. Well, I, that's great because that's what, what draws me to you? Uh, I think you have a great intellect. You're well read, but more importantly, too, though, you got a great radio voice. I mean, it's a fantastic voice. So every time I hear you talk, whether it's you know on AM radio or when I listen to some of your stuff, podcasts, uh, you just you captivate my hearing, and I just pay attention to what you're saying because of your voice. It's incredible. Well, so. thank well, thank you. <laughs> Communication's imp important. Yeah. Well, why is communication important? Well, for a scientist, it's extraordinarily important. Um, I got into communication because of my mentor. I worked with Carl Sagan okay. at Cornell. And he was one of the leading publicizers of science. And one thing he told me is that scientists have to go direct. We can't go through the media because the media is becoming more and more problematic. So scientists have to go directly to the public to communicate science. And so I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. And by the way, he got involved in some public policy issues as well. Did he? Because he felt the need to do so? Because he thought some things were too important. And scientists have a certain perspective that are useful. So I believe, you know, people like myself should get into the public arena when we have things to contribute. Well, absolutely. And I, that showed, to me, that shows leadership. And that you're not fearful of the repercussions per se, Right in terms of weighing in on public issues because of, you know, who you are and what your standing is, because it's my, you know, you're still a tenured professor at the university of Washington, right? That's right. And tenure offers some protection. So that's one of the reasons I can speak freely is I do have tenure. And the other thing is I do have a public voice and some folks are maybe a little afraid of the fact I could use that voice, you know, you know, against them if, if, if things came to that. So I think I have a little bit of protection here. So that's why I'm willing to speak very frankly. That's great. Um, I, I appreciate that. And I think one of the, 
the reasons why we started this podcast as a union was to engage in that public debate. Um, and moreover, because of the media lens that I sometimes I go after, the inability per se of media, maybe it's intentional, non-intentional, but they don't really get to the heart of the problem. Sometimes it's skewed by politics. So one of the reasons that I think gets the voice of public safety out in terms of police officers in this in this city particularly, but nationwide, is to engage in that public debate and bring intellectuals on like yourself to have these discussions. Because when we were in August of 2020 at City Hall, we were facing a dire situation. We had activist groups and politicians backing their play to a degree of you know, canceling police officers, defunding police officers. And I think when there's a breakdown in public order uh, and, you know, and uh, not a clear message going out to restore order, we have a serious problem. And uh, your message that day um, and what you've done on your weather blog in terms of weighing into social issues, I think to me, move the needle um, to a reasonable approach on these, on these conversations. Well, thank you. And, you know, one thing, I'm, I'm a citizen of this city as well. Yeah. And the things I've seen, the, the problems I've seen, the degradation I've seen over the last few years is just stunning. And so, I mean, I've been here for quite a long time. And, and that obviously is a problem for many of us. I'm not the only one who feels this way. Yeah. And then you, I think one thing that we can, we'll have a link in the description for people to, to look at your blog. And uh, it's, it's called the Cliff Mass Weather Blog. And, you know, you title it right below. This blog discusses current weather, weather prediction, climate issues, and current events. And to me, that, you know, obviously I have an interest in weather. I love the Pacific Northwest. And the weather has become a political conversation um, in terms of climate issues. Right. But moreover, the current events, which I'm so happy that you've had the courage to weigh in as a tenured professor, somebody who has buy into the community, you're well-read, you're, I would refer you to you as an intellectual, somebody who has no problem debating people or hearing different perspectives and correcting the record. But you had a blog, and we'll have a link into here as well, August 5th of 2020, where you title it Seattle, A City in Fear Can Be Restored. So to me, the essence of this, you captured what currently was going on at the time, but you leave it to the reader to have the buy-in, if you will, or the takeaway that it's positive, it can be fixed, restored. To me, that was compelling. But that also led to some significant pushback on you where That's correct. Yeah. you know, you want to talk about what happened and we can break it down. Sure. Well, you know, I, I like everyone else, saw what was happening to the city. And many people, and I'm not alone, was, were outraged by the violence that was being allowed. You know, this is political violence. And for me, this really goes back to some of the fascist times in the 20th century. Sure. That, you know, violence was used for political ends. Um, one situation that really hit me is uh, there were these uh, Antifa people that were running around Seattle, and, and there was a group of them that were heading towards U Village. I was biking home from the UW, okay, during this period. And so some bikers were ahead of me, and they got, and they got close to the Antifa crowd. And those people push the bike, bikers over. Just they, push them over. They push them over deliberately to hurt them. And boy. These are just normal citizens? These are just normal people. So I realized that there was something going on here. This, this, this was, these were people that, you know, the violence was a really important part of their worldview. Then they tried to get into the U, to U Village. They couldn't get in because there were enough guards there. And then they, then they went over to Safeway and they broke that place up, the mm -hmm. windows there. Mm -hmm. So that had a big eff effect on me. And so I took a little trip downtown one day, and I walked around downtown, and I saw what had happened to downtown. It was stunning. Someone who's lived here for decades. The stores were boarded up because they were afraid you know, the Antifa guys were going to break the sure. windows. I saw homeless people sleeping on the floor. And then I saw drug deals going down on 3rd Avenue. So I said, oh, my God, look what's happened to the city. And all that within the context of defund the police and other terrible ideas. And so I wrote a blog about it, you know, and uh, that blog had some impacts on my life, to put it, to put it mildly. Um, to give you an example, immediately, 
the radio station that I was doing the weather on. Five minutes, just the weather. How long have you been doing the weather on in that station? Oh, for uh, roughly nine years. It's a long time. It's a long time. And so I, I got a call almost immediately, you know, within, within you know, four or five hours. I'm imagining from management. From management. Management wanted to talk to me, and they said, you're off. Suspended. Well, you're off. Off the air. You're yeah. off. You, we, wow. we cannot. And so they were getting a lot of complaints from some of the, you know, politicized folks in their community. Sure. And so they, you know, they ended that. So can I interrupt you real quick? Sure. So before I lose my train of thought, could that pressure on management from the activist groups, I'm imagining it was activist groups, right? could that be interpreted from those people who wanted you demanding that you were removed? Could that be considered political violence? Well, I don't know if it's violence, but it's certainly an inability to hear a different viewpoint. And by the way, there was a back, things had been happening at that radio station before. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, some of the new management were very activist types, you know, very left-leaning activist types. Sure. And so they were very unhappy with what I was saying in my blog about climate change, interestingly enough. You know, I try to provide a very fact-based view of cli- a, sure. a, a story about climate change. You know, I've probably written more papers on the climate of our region than anybody. So, I mean, I'm intimately knowledgeable of, of this field. And so I was saying, well, it's not going to be a catastrophe. We're not going to, everybody's not going to die in 10 years. And so I was saying that kind of stuff in my blog. Well, some of these people who were supporters of that radio station didn't like that. Mm. Before that, they actually did an investigation of me. They had some people investigate my science. Now, I came out perfectly clean, of course. Yeah. But that's what was going on at that stage. Because you were, you were going against the, the, the narrative. I was right? going against the narrative. So I was learning very. Re- I knew they weren't happy with me because of because uh, of some of the things I said on my blog that I was trying to give the real science. Sure. And so they didn't need much. So then when I you know started saying that this violence is bad and we should not defund the police, that was the end game for them. And I was off the radio station. Wow. So I mean, talk about this is a public radio station. Yeah. Taxpayer money, right? Funded. They get some tax mayor and contributors. And so they did not believe in freedom of speech. You know, one of the essential it's one of the foundations of our, of our nation exactly. and our, our civilization is freedom of speech. They didn't believe in that. And this is not for speech I had on the radio station. It was speech I had on my blog or, you know, outside. So that's what happened there. It was, it was very disturbing. Very disturbing. Well, that, that must have been a, just a personal hit on you, too. Like, you know, you, you, something that you put in nine years of work, right? right? Where you care deeply about weather issues, climate, and you're, you're, you're obviously a science, scientist of it, right? You study it. And then to have that remove that platform because of political pressure, to me, that's, that's life-altering. Yeah. Well, it's even worse than that in a sense. I played a crucial role in saving the station. They were going to be bought out by KUOW. So I really believe in diversity of viewpoint. And so I really pushed very hard to save that radio station. I went to the president of the university, and I'm not going to get into the full story. You sure, read my blog. Fine. But I, I played a crucial role in saving the station to preserve diversity of viewpoint in our community. And the fact I was kicked off because I had a different view than some of the left-leaning listeners or supporters, I mean, it's amazing, you yeah. know? Yeah. Would you, con- you know, to, to get into to, to you, if you're comfortable answering this, would you consider yourself a moderate? Or would you consider yourself a, a, a leftist or a person on the right? Where, would, where, would, where do you align? Are you comfortable answering that? Oh, I'm very comfortable. I'm, I'm a real moderate. Yeah. I'm a Seattle I, moderate. A I Seattle am a moderate. Democrat. I vote for people on both sides of the political spectrum. Sure. You know, I try to decide who I think is going to do the best job, right? So I don't vote for one party or the other. I vote for I've, I have voted for both parties yeah, one time. But they have no problem trying to uh, paint you as this right wing lunatic, correct? Well, they never actually said that. They never I, said they it. never said I was a lunatic or anything. Well, but, I like the word lunatic yeah. for some reason. But some of the there's some of the people who were supporting them, some of their you know yeah. listeners, they did. Say things sort of say like, things like that that I was some Put kind of Trump. I was a Trumpite or something like that, yeah. you know. So anyway, so I'm a moderate, and that's why it was kind of disturbing for this public radio station 
didn't care about freedom of speech. Didn't bother. They they wanted to make the their sort of left leaning portion of their support supporters happy. Mm-hmm. So that so that, that was the story there, but the story didn't end there. Then it happened. Then things happened at the University of Washington. Uh, there was a bunch of uh, graduate students, mainly and some postdocs, that put together a petition to get me kicked out of the University of Washington to to fire you as a professor, to fire me for professor, to take away my graduate students, to go to the funding agencies and tell them not to fund me. I mean, uh, who who led that effort? This was led by the student, there's some people in the student union. The student union. Student union. They, 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 they've been unionized. The yeah. graduate students have been unionized. So the whole thing, I mean, that was really outrageous. And so, they were, so there was a petition, and, and they got some, a few signatures, but it never went anywhere. Right. But it was despicable. I'm sure it was some sleepless nights for you. Yeah. Well, I knew I was safe I, in the sense that I had tenure. And I, it's not like I broke any law or I didn't do anything wrong. Well, can, can you describe to the audience, and I think tenure is self-explanatory, but would you mind just elaborating that? Like, what gives you as a professor of a major college university tenure? What does that mean? What kind of protection is that? Sure. Well, I mean, first we start out being in a state university, mm-hmm. and there's very strong protections at state universities for freedom of speech, because there should be. Sure. Okay? And so this is not like a private school that can quiet people down. But a, a public university, you know, freedom of speech should be inviolate. Mm-hmm. Then tenure is something you get after, generally after seven years, if you do well in your teaching and research, you get tenure. And basically tenure is a protection. It was put there originally to protect people's freedom of speech. So, so professors can debate and get into controversial issues. Absolutely. You, know, you want that, right? You want the young, the young generation, the new generation, to hear varying viewpoints, not constrained to hear one popular one. So it is very protective. They can't fire you unless you do something totally illicit. You know, if you rape, rape a co-ed or yeah, something like that. commit a crime. You commit a crime, they can get you. Right. But it, we're saying something that other people don't like, they can't. And so that, 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 was, that was protective. So... I even spoke to the president of the university about the whole thing. So I, would, I was never really threatened. In the sense. I wasn't wait, staying up night worrying that I wasn't going to sure. lose my job. But it's very disconcerting. And I could see some of the people who signed it, even you know, one, a graduate student in my department signed it, saying that you should be fired and stripped of everything because you have a different view about political violence than they do. It's stunning. It's stunning. It is stunning. And there's something we can get into maybe at, you know, during this conversation is how things have changed at the you, university. Oh, absolutely. I would love to explore that because I think what it all comes back down to is all those issues lead to public safety conversation. And if you remove, you know, basic rights of freedom of speech for you, well, then there's nobody safe. And especially like that point when you and I first met where they were coming after the police and yeah. trying to defund the police and remove police officers what's left in society in terms of law and order. Right. The rule of law, it's gone. Right. Well, the the foundation of any civilization is the protection of of, of life and property, right? Absolutely. I mean, public safety is is where any civilization starts. And without that, civilization cannot succeed. Yeah, and, and, you know, we'll just... So part of the blog, we'll get back to the blog and why that impacted them threatening your tenure, your job. Um, you got into the political violence and the, the people that were engaging in the destruction in this city during 2020 and right. post-2020. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but the way you pronounce it, you, you know, one of your paragraphs, you says, Seattle has experienced a summer of fear and failure, completely accurate, right. with criminal activities reminiscent of Nazi Germany during the 1930s. During that time, the thugs broke the windows of Jewish businesses throughout Germany, right. painted offensive statements on walls, and threaten all those who oppose them. Now Seattle's had its crystal knocked. Is that right. the proper way to say it? Yeah, crystal knocked. Yeah. And the pictures of what occurred during the past weeks are eerily similar similar to those of 80 years ago. And you have some some pictures. And then you go back into describing Seattle's brown shirts have hidden within the protest groups attempting to destroy businesses, both to deliver a political message of fear and to loot their contents. And I think that was 
That's what really got that me into trouble. That really launched this effort to really cancel you. Right. Because these people who were doing some of these things, they want to think of themselves as the noble, as the noble folks that are protecting uh-huh. the victims. And there's a mindset of there's the world can be divided into two groups. There's the victims and there's the oppressors. Mm-hmm. And, and unfortunately, the police are considered the oppressors by these folks. And so you can do almost anything you want to the oppressors. That's, that's fine. And do anything you think is right to protect the victims. And this is a mindset that has pervaded. And so how does that mindset, how does that develop in these young adults? Is it through the, the, the teachings in schools, or is it more so a social influence of people that they look up to? It's definitely a political, what would you call it, indoctrination, if you will? Is that overstepping this? Well, you know, I can tell you how I think this is how, how, how developed. Okay. Well, first, you know, let's, let's go back to the University of Washington 40 years ago. Sure. I was there 40 years ago. I remember what it was like. Politically, kind of almost evenly divided, you know, it, there were people on both sides, very tolerant, okay? But the political, you know, structure of the university has changed a lot. Um, faculty now are probably 10 to 1, maybe 15 to 1 or 20 to 1 of one party versus another, okay? okay. A certain worldview. So there's a, there's a political change that's, that's, a, that's occurred. Those are big numbers. So that was a big number. So, was, so we have that sort of the political angle has changed of most of the faculty. So that's, that's there. We also have an amazingly poorly educated student body coming in. And this is not only in my field, in science and math, but in other fields. So like freshmen coming into the university, whatever their education was prior, they're not as educated as they once were since 40 years ago, correct? That's right. I can't teach. That's a problem. I can't teach. You know, I teach atmospheric sciences. I can't use the math that I used 30, 40 years ago. They go crazy. They don't have they don't have the skills. So Just basic th- math, basic math. Um, in my one on one class, most of them can't even do fractions right. So I mean, this is like basic stuff. But it's not only in math, but it's in the other areas. They know li- very little bit about his very little about history. They knew very little about government, and so they come in with tremendous ignorance. Then on top of that, we have the problems with the media. Let's say the media is not doing a very good job in educating people about what's going on or, mm-hmm. or what, the, what historical events. I know about the media because I, you know, I, I know in my own field, the media terribly distorts science, like sure. climate, weather. I mean, it's terrible. Which has led you to get into the current events of this because you have to weigh in because it's so, the, the messaging is way off. Right? The media is no, the record. Right. The media is no longer telling the truth. Yeah. The media is no longer unbiased. Mm-hmm. They're very biased. They have a certain viewpoint and they push it. Okay. So we have a failed media. We have a failed education system. Okay. Then you come to the university where, you know, there's a certain political bias that's certainly there. And you get into trouble. I mean, a great example at the University of Washington is what is the is the attempts to destroy the George Washington statue. Yeah, this goes. They 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 they've tried to put ropes around it. They've put painter on it. Okay, they've done everything they can to destroy or tear down that statue. Put all kinds of signs around it, and they're pushing to get it taken away. Well, you know, and say the and the whole thing is you know George Washington was a slave over, right? But they know so little history. They don't understand that George Washington, people of his period, they had tremendous insight into, into, into human psychology. And they created a government that created democracy that will, would eventually free all the slaves and provide freedom to virtually everyone. Mm-hmm. Okay? They don't seem to understand that. They just want to destroy. So it's a George Washington statue. There's other statues. But it's a whole mindset of these students, an extraordinarily simplistic mindset. Naive. It's naive. It's uneducated, it's naive, and it can be very destructive. So I was stunned to see students and other faculty think that the violence that happened in 2020 was okay. It was fine to have violence against storefronts. It was fine to hurt police. It was fine. 
because they were they were doing you know the Lord's work, protecting the victims. Yeah, they were pre- holding the oppressors accountable. That's right. They were taking on the oppressors. Now I'm a science guy. You know, I'm I'm really interested in numbers. So I looked at the numbers on you know on interactions of police with with folks and to see whether there's a, the police are killing you know people of certain minority groups more than others. Yes. You know, preferentially. Right. And I looked at the numbers. And it wasn't true. Not true at all. It isn't true at all. If anything, police, I think, are being more careful for minorities and, uh, th- than they are for, for, for other populations. I would absolutely agree, and I would say those minority communities, they're more supportive of the police because they understand they need the police. That's right. Because that's where the crime is. The, the majority of the crime comes from. And that was the interesting thing of that blog. I got contacted by a number of people in the minority community saying that I was right. I wouldn't doubt that. I, I haven't advertised that, and I didn't g- haven't given names, but I had a number of people in the minority community that was behind me, and on top of that, I had got tremendous support from the Jewish community. Of course, yeah. So people who understand what's going on, they were very supportive. And so I think you're you you nailed it. What we just talked about, you know, Seattle's brown shirts have hidden within the protest groups. You, you nailed it. And the interesting thing is, people think brown shirts or black shirts were on the right. They weren't. No. They were on the left. Yeah, absolutely. The Nazis w- were socialists and leftists. Mm-hmm. Mussolini's black shirts were the same way. That's right. So it's all on the left. This and, they, and they were the oppressors, basically. You can right. make that connection. Oh, my God, yes. And actually, fascism was very closely related to communism. They're just, just basically different brands of the same, sure. some of the same ideas. Sure. And so these, these students, they don't understand that. They have no knowledge of history. Well, how do we... How do we realign this thing? Is it possible? I mean, have we gone from 40, you know, you were 40 years ago, you, you started, right? Right. What's it going to look like 40 years from now? Like, if it's this bad, and the educational system, from whatever, kindergarten to, you know, eighth grade, if you will, ninth grade, if it's, if it's that bad, or ninth grade to 12th grade, if it's that bad, is there any hope for us here? Like how do we how do we get back to a moderate viewpoint where people are informed? I hate saying educated because people take that right. as a negative, you know, hit against people. How do we get back to something that's reasonable? Well, that's an important question. There's a number of us in the university. There's, there is a there's a group of us that are trying to restore sanity. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's called the Heterodox Academy Group. Heterodox. Heterodox. There's a national group called the Heterodox Academy. And it was started by a very well-known uh, psychologist, Jonathan Hyde. Jonathan Hyde. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, this is a national group. This is a national enterprise. And we have probably 100 members of the faculty at the University of Washington campus that are talking together. 100. That's yeah. Good. Which is a good start. It's a great start. And there's more that support us. But, but are afraid. Afraid to speak up. And we've had a number of faculty say they were afraid to speak frankly. Yes, yes. So that's going on. So there's a number of us starting to push back. And the question is how successful we can be. I think things are not as bad now as they were in 2020. To, yeah, you definitely feel a bit of a shift. I would agree with you. There's a definitely been a shift, a favorable shift. Um, there's, still some pro- there's still a lot of problems they're still try- they have these they're spending fortunes on diversity folks that are sort of pushing a certain line mm-hmm. okay but i think we are making some progress so I- i'm hopeful that that but the underlying problems are still extraordinarily serious i mean the, the education system is terrible social media is playing a very negative role crushing yeah it's a crushing role so between poor educational system social media playing a bad role we have some very strong underlying problems. Yeah. And it's almost like we've lost the moderate viewpoint, right? To, to a degree. I mean, maybe, we're re- maybe what you're describing now is a realignment towards the moderate viewpoint. But where we were in 2020 was basically the, the tipping point where we could have lost a lot of things, right? That's right. There are some moderates left. A lot of them are afraid. To speak. To say something. So at the university, the moderates, most of them just keep their heads down because they're afraid about the impacts on their career. Well, what keeps you going? I mean, you've been there for 40 years. and You, you and I are having a conversation. You seem in great health. 
You've got yeah. energy. Right. But what makes you keep pushing the needle here? Well, I feel very strongly about this issue. Um, and I'm not in a vulnerable position. If I can't do it, who can do it? Who will? You know? So, you know, I, there's a few people that, that are supportive of the same ideas. But, but, you know, they're worried. I mean, there is a cost to trying to tell the a truth. A personal cost and a professional cost, right? There is. There are costs here. But it's worth trying to do to, to what we can. That, you gave me a, I've had chills on this uh, podcast from a guest before. That was from We Heart Seattle, but uh, literally just gave me some chills because it gives me hope that it's worth fighting for, meaning our society, yeah. right? Our way of life. Right. And another reason I'm optimistic is I think people have had enough. Yeah. People just, uh, people in the city have had enough of what's going on. And I can tell, I live in a community in Northeast Seattle, okay? You know, a middle, a middle class area of Seattle. Sure. And things are not going well for us. I mean, our mailboxes are being broken into multiple times a month. We have homeless people coming up, living on you know, the Burke Hillman Trail and coming mm-hmm. up and, and hassling people. And, and, and there's all kinds of things happening. And I, I just in my conversations, People want change. Yeah, I mean, I think what you're describing, people have had enough. Would it be, would I be okay to say people have had enough of the wokeism, the woke culture? I think the woke culture is kind of captures what we're talking about. Well, they blame the woke culture. Okay. And these are people of all political, you know, yeah. angles and, and beliefs. You know, so it's just not one people want, but people are being physically threatened in yeah. their lives. And, you know, and... Right now, the, if you call the police, you know, let's say they don't come as fast as they used to, that's right? Um, before, there was restrictions of people speeding on certain roads, and that's not being checked as much as well, it used to be. We don't have the cops to check it. Right. So, people know it. Okay. So. But sometimes, I, I agree with what you're saying, but then I look at the election results, and we are pushing hard for uh, a moderate prosecutor to, to take right. over a King County prosecuting attorney role. And we obviously we've had public support of Jim Farrell, and now he lost by ten points. A significant loss. Right now we've got a what I would view as somebody in office, Lisa Mannion, that in, supports more of the woke culture and um, acquiescing to a lot of the activist groups. And we're seeing seasoned prosecutors now leave that office because they know what's coming. And right. m- my fear is that. The people that you're describing that have had enough, like their mailboxes are getting broken into, car prowls. I don't necessarily think that they're having enough when it comes to voting properly. Does that make sense? Right. Well, one thing I should point out is Ann Davison did win. Yeah, it, for city attorney. I mean, that's city. more misdemeanor stuff, low right, level. Right. We're talking about felony sure. stuff, which is violent crimes, you sure. know. Well, I think this is connected with the politicization of our community. And the fact is people see themselves as one brand or the other. Mm. And 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 sometimes that and that seems to overwhelm their own self interest. Sometimes ah, it's counterintuitive, right? But I think there's some of that going on, and I think the in the end the solution to that is sort of depoliticize, you know, society. public safety. Well, you got to yeah. stop politicizing yeah. public safety. safety. Yeah, and I've said it before too. Like to your point, people are having enough, but it's going to take more people having crime visit their doorstep to really get active and start changing the way they vote or they get involved. Yeah, I think that's true. But I have seen the attitudes change. Good. As, that's as positive. Pu- as public safety slips, you know, it is changing people's views. Do you think we have to hit a, a significant low point in order for that to to do a, a complete 180? Have we hit that low point already? Is that low point coming again? Or what do you think? 2020, I guess you could probably capture that that was a low point. Have we hit it yet, though? Yeah, so 2020 had all kinds of things happening that made it more complex, okay. from COVID to the Floyd situation sure. to, to whatever, right? National politics. So there was all kinds, and there's national politics, yeah. okay. Um, there was still quite a bit of the national politics stuff involved in this past election. But I'm hoping that the next election could be different. How so? Well, I think, you know, depending on what candidates are floating around, you know, perhaps the hyper-political stuff will 
be a little bit less this time and people will think a little bit more before they vote. Um, things are getting worse, and I think that is going to have an impact. I mean, I can see how attitudes are shifting here. Uh, I think you're going to see some interesting results for, this, for the, uh, the, the elections, the next elections where the city council comes up. Mm -hmm. I, think I think people I th understand that that's where the focus needs to be to change things in the city. Sure. Uh, yeah, I, well, you're saying it better than I yeah. than I have. Um, they've decimated this police agency, yeah. and so, I and I say it time and time again. But you know, DOJ came here in 2012. They took over. Um, we did it voluntarily as a city. Right. Sure. We've spent over a hundred million dollars having DOJ here, taxpayer money, and millions of dollars a month keeping them here. Um, and ironically enough, you know. We were the model reformed agency days before Floyd. Right. Termination paperwork, and then Floyd happens, and then they pull the paperwork, and DOJ is still here. Um, but the DOJ basically saved this city, the policies, from complete, utter breakdown. Right. That, that was, that's the irony of this. So I think you're right. I think there is a change happening, but it's slow, but that's a, that's a positive development. And I think people realize that their efforts have to go into the city council. Yes. And I th I've talked to many, many people. So I think you going if, if there's, I think the most important thing now is to have reasonable candidates coming up. Reasonable. I love that word. Yeah. And I think if some reasonable candidates are available, they will win. And I think you could see a radical shift in the city council. I think that's possible. It'd be great. Radical shift meaning... A shift back to moderate Ra people. A shift to a moderate, rational view. Of rational, people. reasonable view. Right. I think that's possible. Good. I th well, you hear that from Cliff's words <laughs> to your ears. There is hope here. So let you sent something to me as we were exchanging some emails in preparation for today's taping. And um, I thought this was just fascinating. We're getting back to more of the educational uh conversation in terms of students that are uninformed and have this political viewpoint right. that is grossly uninformed but you're you, you know it's it's we'll have a link in here it's from front page magazine it's from sarah dogan um the top 10 fascist universities in america great title right and i'm stunned that university of washington is number two that's right why? And it's even worse than that. Another rating came out by a group called FIRE. I have that link as well. And, and th this is a bipartisan national organization to promote freedom. Bipartisan. Bipartisan organization devoted to freedom of speech uh, in the United States. In fact, I just went to one of their meetings recently in Los Angeles. And they rated all the universities in terms of you know, how good they are in freedom of speech uh, ideas. And... University of Washington was the worst of any public university in the country. Well, you would, uh, I'm going to pause, stop you there. You would think that a progressive city that is a supportive of diversity of thought and including other voices to be part of the conversation, you think that that would be not the case in terms of how poorly ranked they are. Well, when they talk about diversity, it's not really about diversity of thought. That's the problem. Right. Their idea is diversity of certain groups. You know, this is identity politics. Which hinders the ability to have diversity of thought. That's exactly right. And so there really is no intention to have true diversity of thought. Uh, that is not what's going on here. It's diver diversity of groups that are being accepted to the university or you know, that kind of thing. So that's the problem. Diversity of thought is, is not being encouraged. Why is that being encouraged then? What, what's the overall goal then? If, it, you know, if you've got you know, fire, and put a link in the description here, it says University of Washington overall score out of a top score of 100 is 28.61% of college free speech ranking. That is crazy. It's very unfortunate. And the university has shown itself willing to go after faculty that have a different viewpoint. I mean, so it's administration based upon student union pressure or activist pressure? 
Well, I think, you know, there's certainly pressure from some of the student activists and the union, but some of this is coming from above as well. There are a number of very politically, I don't know, I don't know how to say this, engaged folks in administration. Sure. And they are pushing a certain viewpoint. And so that is having an impact. I mean, the, the most famous case is a, prof- is a professor in computer science named Stu- Stuart Regis. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we are being pushed to have this land, uh, this land grant or this, other, or this land acknowledgement before every, every seminar or, or talk or whatever. Sure. You know, saying, you know, we are on the lands that were stolen from this group or that group, okay? Yeah. He came, he didn't think it was done very well, and he came up with his own version that was a little different. He got into tremendous trouble. The dean of the college... Just changing some words? Changing or having a different version of that, that, that land acknowledgement. The, unit, the dean set up another, another section of the class to compete with his directly and encourage the students to leave his class. No way. The dean? The dean. And this was okayed by higher administration. So that's, that's, not, that's not too good. Um, it may, I, I was involved in another, another issue... Um, I was, uh, th- there was some initiatives here in Washington state. Mm-hmm. It was a carbon, it was a, 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 a gas tax initiative. Sure. It was called 1631. Mm-hmm. I remember. You remember that? And yep. before that, there was another one called 732. The idea is you can work on climate change by taxing gas. Okay. So the 732, which was bipartisan, uh, that would take some of the, uh, it, w- it would get all that money that was brought in and give it back to people. Okay, it was revenue neutral. The activists were against that because they wanted the cash. Of course, it's all money driven. It's, it's all money driven. Yep. So that got that lost, and the, and even the governor was against that too. You know, he he claims he cares about climate change, but he was against that initiative. So then they came up with another initiative, sixteen thirty one, which they got all the money. They there was the gas tax, and they spread among their their groups. Well, I was against that one. And I was publicly against it in my blog. Therefore, you're fighting the money grab. So, so then what happened is I was being accused of racism because of, because of that. And so what happened was the How chair... How was that racist? Because, you know, some of these minority groups would have gotten the, money, the cash. You know, I, I, I used an analog that any educated person knows. Pigs of the trough. There's okay. pigs of the trough... Yeah. This was used for 100 years, and it's about fat cats getting money at the Absolutely, public trough, yeah. right? The students didn't know it. The students, they no had no clue. idea. So I used that analog that this was like pigs at a trough. And so, they, and so it was decided that was racist. So the students were upset with me. They went to the chair of the department and the dean, and then they had the dean of diversity put out a statement that they distributed around the department that certain blogs were being racist by being against this initiative. Holy cow. This is at the University of Washington. So, so that would support why UW's rank number two as far as being a right. fascist, you know, supportive, you know, university because of lack of free speech. Right. So, there, unfortunately, some administrators at the University of Washington have been willing to suppress free speech when it's against their political viewpoint. That's cr- that's, that's not only crazy. crossing a line. That's, that's crazy. Sh- that's jumping a line. And so that is going on. And that is why, well, unfortunately, some of the ratings are not so good for the University of Washington in these areas. That's a breakdown in our community. And, you know, you're to see that it's already being impacted with just public safety, right? Because you have these students that have this mindset. And we'll go back to the tragic uh, shooting about a week and a half ago at Ingram High School, a local Seattle high school, where a student was murdered on campus. There's been no police there because the Seattle Public School Board removed police officers as student resource officers from campuses right. post Floyd. Right. So there's no police intervention there, and then it's opened up campuses to violence. But that you had the student union from that high school not wanting police present during camp, you know, time on campus. Right. To, because they don't want violent police officers. None of that is. Accurate. Oh, I know. So the, 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 the terrible tragedy of this is that the most vulnerable people, the people you're trying to protect are the ones that are being hurt by this. 
And I should mention, in terms of a public safety issue around the University of Washington, it's become acute. I mean, the violence that is right off of campus now, it's every day. I, we get these notices, this sure. alert from the, the, from the University of Washington police. And it seems like every other day there's another shooting, attack, or whatever, or car or carjacking right near the University of Washington campus. And the students have the mindset that they don't need police because the police are the problem, right? I mean, these that I'm citing the Ingram High School example of the student union people, the, the body there, saying no police, no violent police officers. Of course, we don't want violent police officers. But you, just that disconnect to me is stunning. But some of the students are starting to get it. Because I hear them talking about how they want to go in large groups when they go off campus. Because, good. See, because Cliff, bringing it back to a positive conversation. <laughs> well, but, but it's also a sign of the problem, that the students uh, understand that th- there's a danger for them. And, and they are very getting more and more careful that some of them won't go off campus at night, because that's where a lot, of the, a, lot, a lot of the problems are. So the students are getting to understand something's going on. Well, then hopefully then you can change hearts and minds or at least p- plant something to have a different perspective, a thought, which creates open dialogue, discussion, right? Right. Which maybe could get the UW not ranked in the top five of <laughs> non-free speech schools, maybe back to a moderate approach. Well, another encouraging thing, just two days ago, I learned a number of undergraduates are, are coming together to create a group to promote free speech and diversity of viewpoint. Love it. So that's positive. So, you know, we'll see how it plays out. But I think there are a few positive signs here. So I, you shouldn't get completely negative yet. No, I, you know, I don't think we are getting completely negative And, you know, I think you're bringing a positive message that I, I'm just, you basically give me hope. Somebody who's had buy-in for over 40 years yeah. at, the, at a university, that you think there's still hope. And I love that. It's yeah. a positive message. Like as as bad as the police um, staffing crisis is right now, yeah. there's still hope in the future, and we can build back to where we once were. And you know, obviously, the election next election is going to have a significant hand right. in that. And more people waking up, if you will, to the realities of public safety impacting their daily lives, I think, right. will change move this. And to your point, students now realizing that their safety is in jeopardy. Right. Creates, in my view, the ability to have open discussion. And homeowners. As to why. And people living in the city, apartment, people live in apartments and, and, and homes and houses, they're starting to see it as well. Do you, do you think that if we continue down this path of people not supportive of other perspectives on conversation and Blaming police is the problem. Do you think that that could lead to a labor shortage of police officers, meaning students gravitating towards public safety jobs when they get out of college or get out of high school? Is that a problem for us in our society? Yeah, well, I don't know about that, quite frankly. You know, um, but I have seen that it seems to be more interest in. I don't know if it's public safety jobs, but defense jobs. I think more students are getting interested in like military careers. Actually, the, right. the University of Washington actually has, has one of the biggest ROTC, ROTC? units in the, in the country. Is that right? And so... I didn't know that. So there are that group. Those are some of the students that talk to me. There are some students like that at the University of Washington that are very concerned, okay, and who want to go into those kind of careers. So it's not... I can't tell people going into, you know, becoming police or whatever, but I'm certainly interested in that, that, that general public safety thing. They're I like still to interested. hear that. Yeah. But, you know, we have underlying problems. The, we still have this failing K-12 system. That's still there. We still have a failing media. We still have the social media problem, right? Mm-hmm. So those are big problems. They're, un, they're foundational. Under, foundational, yeah. And so things won't be really better until we fix some of those up. And that, that's a hard nut to crack. How can we as police officers change the narrative, if you will, or what can we do better in your eyes? What can we do? Well, it's We're not perfect. Right. We're humans, right? Well, none of us are perfect. But I think probably the most important thing you can do is better information. I mean, I think this, your podcast is actually a, a really good example of that. Um, but having the, having the raw numbers online of public safety, I mean, I go to your the, web, the city has this website, right? Mm-hmm. Having that a little bit, you know, even making that a little more user-friendly, right? 
Yeah. There's issues with it. But I think having very clear information about where the crime is. Non-politicized messaging. What? Non-politicized messaging. Non-politicized. Just what is going on. The facts. The facts. Just the facts, ma'am. Yeah. I think getting the facts out and to see what the trends are like in crime around the city, I think that is very useful information that can help. Move the needle, if you will, of changing perspectives. That's right. I like that. And it's not political. It's just the information. You got anything for me in terms of hard-hitting question that I can talk about or anything that you, you see as problematic? No, I'm but... i put you on the spot here, Cliff. I'll, you want me to put you on the spot? I'll put, put me you on the spot. spot. Okay, Damn it. I'll put you on the spot. You know, I'm kind of fascinated by the psychology of being a police person. Ooh. Okay? And... You know, if you're dealing with problems all the time, I mean, in some ways, it's, a, it's a, an extraordinarily negative job in some ways, right? You're dealing with some, of the, you know, problems of society all the time. Sure. And some, of the, some of the most problematic people. What does that do to you over time I, as a person and your attitudes towards various groups? And how do you prevent that from happening? It's a great uh, question. It's a great question. I think it depends upon the tenure of yeah. a police officer, how long you've been on this job mm -hmm. and what you're exposed to. I've been on 23 years. I've seen some stuff, but I've also had been fortunate to not see things. I haven't seen per se unreasonable, crazy violence against children. Yeah. I've been able, I've been shielded yeah. that in my career. Thank right. God. Right. But we've got detectives that I just, admire that are part of internet crimes against children and yeah. the stories I've heard. I don't know if I could handle that yeah. mentally. So we, you know, we're seeing, we see cops, you know, try to alleviate that pressure from the experiences they engage on dealing with human problems, the psychology of it, yeah. you know, having an outlet of alcohol, right? right? Or, uh, going out and committing adultery against their spouse. Right. There's just these, these things that happen to you in terms of an adult as a human doing this job because what we see is the worst of people right? at their worst times. And we need to... Um, and what does that do to you? Yeah. Well, it, I'll, I'll just personalize it about yeah. it to me. So, my, you know, I've got a, I've got a, a daughter and um, she says to me, she goes, you know, you're judgmental. When I, you know, when I see something sure. on the street, and I try to explain as yeah. to why, and I try to yeah. do a self analysis of why I'm judgmental. But police officers, we have to size something up immediately to solve a problem. We have to view what we're seeing with our eyes, process it mentally, right. make the decision how to act on what we see. And then act on it. And right. that has to be instantaneous sometimes. Right. And then you, you do that with your training and experience. And that's right. why those are so important. Um, I, I'm trying to answer your question. It's very difficult as yeah. a human to do this job when you're immersed in negativity all the time. Right. That's why I always encourage police officers to have friends outside of the job. Because you do get different perspectives. Right. You're well read, much like yourself. Yeah. Um, so you have a different perspective. So you're not singular in your personal and your professional life. You have an outlet. That's how you survive this job in a long yeah. career. What we see is people get into circumstances where they're getting into discipline issues right. because there's some psychological issues where they can't process the overwhelming yeah. negativity throughout their career. I hope I've kind of answered that right. to your degree. But, but that's one thing I think society has to give Please, much more credit. They're they're putting themselves psychologically on the line. Yeah, in in this sort of this this miasma of negativity, right? Great word, miasma. You know, and it's just people don't recognize. I think you know how big a sacrifice that is. You know, I think about that all the time. But I think that's it's, people need to think about that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And you know, twenty twenty riots broke people. Yeah, broke cops. I mean, we're just starting to see it now. Of you know, I get dealing with you know, the members and some of the issues that they're, 
that we're dealing with now as a union mm-hmm. based upon the, the human factors of right. people breaking down. The psychological impacts from those riots where, especially the minority officers, were just crushed. Right. Crushed by these right. activists, these, these insults. It was it was it was insane, and um, it's definitely had a profound impact, and we're starting to see it play itself out now. Yeah, two years post, and um, you know it, we're not perfect, but we're humans trying to do a difficult job. Sure. And you know, the union is we, you know, we have to deal with discipline issues, whether or not we're going to appeal something, right. and we're starting to see how the, the the psychosis of the human doing the job of policing impacts the discipline side, the administration right. side, and you got to balance that. Right, um, but I, hey, it's a great job. Okay, it's a great job. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't imagine doing anything else than yeah. just being a copper. Yeah. Well, I sort of to end. All I can tell you is that speaking for the community, we appreciate it. <laughs> we that's really great, do, Cliff. and I and I think you need to hear that more. You Thanks. Know? The, yeah. I appreciate that. It's yeah. the support that's needed. Like yeah. when you walk around. And you're in uniform and you have somebody that just, you, you don't know them, but they come up to you and say, hey, thanks for what you do. Yeah. It, that really moves the needle for us. Right. It does. But sometimes we do some bonehead stuff as yeah. humans, yeah. as a cop. You're like, what, you, what were you thinking? Yeah. You know? Well, we all do. We all do. Yeah. So hey, I appreciate, uh, you know, what, um, what you're standing up for. It's reason. And it gives me, you know, it encourages me. Um, you're leading through your actions it's 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 compelling, um, especially for our community. It's a, this city is worth saving. Sure, our quality of life. It's a beautiful place to live, and we can forecast the weather much better than we did <laughs> thirty forty years ago. <laughs> we didn't talk about that, but that is another great positive. All right, success. well, give us give us your thirty second one minute rundown of the weather situation in the Pacific Northwest right now. P- pretend you're back on what was it? KNKX? What was it? Yeah, KNKX. Yeah. Give me the breakdown, Cliff Mass. Well, it's a tremendously positive story. Um, 50 years ago, we couldn't forecast a major storm the next day. Now we get almost everyone perfect. I mean, I mean, we had really? majors. Oh, it's unbelievable how good we've, we've become. I mean, for instance, the Columbus Day storm, the biggest storm that ever hit our region what in 100 year years, 1962. Look at this. October 12th. Rattling it off. October 12th, 1962. The day before, it was in forecast. Then it hit, had 100 mile per hour winds, terrible devastation. We didn't forecast it at all. But ever since 1990, every major storm we have forecast. You've nailed it. We've nailed them. And so they don't come in, so there's, no, there's no big surprise anymore. We understand all the local meteorology around here, the effects of the mountains and the water and all the local weather features. We understand them pretty much now. We have computer models that can simulate and forecast these local weather features. You know, I'm forecasting all the time. Snowstorms, we never got anything right. Now we're getting more of them right. Mm-hmm. So we've come a huge distance in understanding and forecasting the weather. So that shows you what our species can do, you know, when we apply rationality and science and technology. We can, we can move mountains. And I think in weather forecasting, we've, we've really done that. That's fantastic. I mean, yeah. I can feel your energy of yeah. positivity because you you believe so deeply about it, right? And you're backing it up by numbers, via science, and you're right, right? Right? You predict, and you're proven right more often than not, yeah. right? F- forecasting is definitely right more than it's, <laughs> than it's wrong at this time. I mean, occasionally we have bad, you know, some fore- some forecasting be subtly off, but not close in anymore. So. How do people support you and where can they find Cliff Mass? How do they find your weather blog? And Well, they can just do a search on Google, Cliff Mass Weather Blog, and it'll come right up. I do a podcast as well. How, where's your podcast? How can they find your podcast? Just do a search. It'll come, it'll, it'll come right up. It's, in fact, you, on, my, on my weather blog, I even have a link to it. So they, they can check my podcast or, or, or that. And, and, and I'm still working on that radio station. <laughs> I'm telling them they've got to think about freedom of speech a little bit. So who knows? Maybe they'll you can't do. replace this guy's intellect, nor you can you can't replace his great voice. You can't do it. It's it's impeccable. Parting last words from Cliff Mass. Give us give us something for the audience to take away as we wrap it up here. We've gone an hour. I swear, Cliff, I could talk with you for hours, man. Well, this has been you. great. Well, other than forecasting is much better. All I can all I can tell you is that. You know, there have been very serious issues in this community, but people are worried. And I think people are probably fed up to a point that I think things may change. I think you could see it in the voting patterns the next election. 
So uh, I'm optimistic there. And I think there are a number of people that are starting to stand up for diversity of viewpoint. Not, and I think you're seeing some changes in that dimension too. So we'll see. Cliff Mass, great leader in our community, uh, advocate for diversity of thought. Is uh, moves the needle for me, man. Um, I look you. up to you. Thank you for your time. And uh, thanks for having me. Absolutely, come back anytime, buddy. Okay. Thanks everybody for watching. Please support Cliff Mass. Thank a police officer, and um, it's a pleasure to uh, serve you in this community and across the nation. Until next time, maybe we all can uh, get along if we take away the major points of this conversation and hold the line together. Take care. Bye. Is that okay? It was awesome. We crushed it. Okay. I don't know. <laughs>